Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You have no announcements. Oh, oh well, I actually I, I have a curious curious. Um, yeah. is this the last uh, talk for a while? Um, well, not if we can persuade Sam to talk next week. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that depends on that. Or if Sam can't do it and, and anybody else can't do it, this will be the last one. Okay. What about Ove? He hasn't spoken. Lately. It's a possibility. <clears throat> oh, right. Okay. <clears throat> we'll see. Okay, off you go, Lou. Okay. Uh, so this is um, continuing a talk I gave before. And uh, I think I sent you some notes which were similar to these. These notes actually have a, a little more in them, and I will give you a little picture of that. And then I'm going to talk about um, Kinsevich Integral in relation to Witten's Integral. That's what I'm planning to talk about today. But let me slide through these notes a little bit and point out some things that are in them that we might use if I gave yet another talk at some point. Oh, I'm just sliding through here, pardon me. Um, You'll recall that we were talking about Witten's integral, and uh, that in the first talk uh, we explained what these various things meant: uh, the gauge field, the Wilson loop, which is the holonomy around the loop, the trace of it, and the Chern-Simons form, and so on. And that we had given a heuristic argument to the effect that, excuse me, I'm pushing things past you at a high rate. Uh, we had given a heuristic argument to the effect that if you were to vary the loop a little bit and watch what happens formally to the integral, um, that you would find that the integrand changed by having a double insertion of Lie algebra into the Wilson loop and a volume form. So of an infinitesimal volume form, so that if the if the curve didn't trace out any volume, then the heuristic says that nothing happened, uh, and it's invariant. And uh, otherwise, there's some framing compensation, and one can follow that out and um, and see a lot of different things. Um, among other things, one can see that. What are we if, integrating over? Pardon me? What are we integrating over in that expression? Well, you're integrating over all gauge fields. Uh, you're integrating uh -huh. over, uh, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Um, and that means that you don't know how to do that integral because there, no one knows a a general measure theory for that. Should that worry you? Um, probably. Uh, the double Lie algebra insertion results in the following kind of formula for the difference of the invariant if you have a crossing and you reverse the crossing, switch the crossing, then that, yeah, that does amount to a deformation that it works three dimensionally and has an has a change, and it results in the Lie algebra being, in, being inserted in one line and in the other line and summed over over that index there. And this may remind you of a formula that you've you've seen for Vasiliev invariance, which has the same form in chord diagrams, where there's a double Lie algebra insertion into the chord diagram. Uh, uh, this this corresponds to a chord in the chord diagram, and this and if you weren't doing anything other than tracing this product of Lie algebra elements and summing, you would be getting an in, you would be getting an evaluation of the chord diagrams that satisfies the four term relation. So this gets turned around uh, without the framework of the functional integral and becomes the Lie algebra weight systems for Vasiliev invariance. And we talked about that. 
Uh, in these notes, there's a little more. And, and I'll put these notes over to Rogers, so you might want to look at them. But we won't talk about them for a long time un, unless there's a third talk at some point later on. Um, but among other things, I have some notes inserted in here about the SUN weight system so that you can see how things work in a concrete way. So I've written down the, the matrix formulation for the SUN weight system and explicitly for the SU3. So you can look at this and see what happens. And certain identities happen, which are quite interesting and will be found in, in perhaps in, uh, for example, in Shmutov's book on the Siliaf invariance, you would find such uh, such identities uh, having to do with the weight system evaluations for Vassiliev invariance. This chasm or sum, this sum over, over Lie algebra elements turns out in the SUN case to add up to something that looks like a simple skein relation involving Kronecker deltas here and here. And that's good for figuring out how the weight systems behave, as you can imagine. Um, and then when you start playing with the invariants themselves and looking at the framing and so on, then uh, these same identities, fierce identities, end up giving you the framing compensations for the invariant. The heuristic calculates correctly and gives you the, re the right framing compensations and so on. And then you reach the limits of the heuristic at certain points, like if you were to follow out um, the um, the difference formula and and take a look at it and play around a little bit, you will get a formula like this at the level of the heuristic, um, a coefficient times the invariant at plus minus another coefficient at times the invariant at minus and a coefficient times the smoothing. But of course, in actuality, these are some power series, and then. If you had the right power series, uh, you would be looking at the Humphrey polynomial specializations. So you can see how the heuristic is close to the reality by looking around at this sort of thing. So I put that in the notes. And then another thing that I put in these notes is the way the Witten integral got used by Smolin and Rovelli in their early version of loop quantum gravity. So in their early version of loop quantum gravity, they did it with functional integrals and they defined um, a wonderful loop transform. So you have a function, which is a value of complex valued function defined on gauge fields. And that's the quantum wave function in their theory. Now I'm not going to do their theory, but I just wanted to show you the idea. You have a quantum wave function defined on gauge fields complex valued function. And they had the idea that they could, instead of thinking about that wave function on the gauge fields, they could think of it on knots by making a kind of enormous Fourier transform where you integrate over all the gauge fields, the product of psi of A with uh, Wilson loop. So this is just like Witten's integral except that psi of A is no longer the churn simons form, exponentiated churn simons form. But you will notice that the exponentiated churn simons form is indeed a complex valued function defined on gauge fields. And so in their early version of loop quantum gravity, uh, the exponentiated churn simons function takes a role and is an important uh, an important entity in the loop quantum gravity. It's an important wave function. So then if you did this, you see, uh, then um, you could, um, and you had an operator uh, that you were interested in on the wave functions. You may have a differential equation involving the wave functions. This is just the philosophy of transforms that you use in, in differential equations. Uh, so you have an operator applied to the wave function, then you're integrating the operator applied to the wave function multiplied by the Wilson loop, and then you use integration by parts and you and transfer the operator over to the Wilson loop. Now that looks like it might do something. And for them, it did a lot. 
uh, and so we're looking at this transfer of operator over to the Wilson loop. If you start with certain functions that are important in their theory, and these are the two, and I'll just show you what happens with this one. Um, this is called the diffeomorphism constraint in their theory. Now, this looks really strange in my diagram, but this is a gauge functional derivative, and this is the curvature tensor, and, um, and that's a, a differential. Um, and the lines mean, of course, that you're summing over common indices. So just take that bug for what it is and think about what would happen if you did a transform. You're applying this G, which is a certain differential operator to the wave function. So you apply it to psi. You integrate by parts and it gets applied to the Wilson loop. And then you're applying this bug to the Wilson loop. But then by the yoga that we had worked out before, differentiating the Wilson loop inserts Lie algebra once into the Wilson loop and makes another dx. And so this bug applied to the Wilson loop does this. And then we knew uh, from our previous formalism that this insertion of curvature tensor and Lie algebra into the Wilson loop is the same as deforming the Wilson loop a little bit. So the differential operator applied to the wave function turns out to be the same as integrating uh, a deformation of the loop. And that means that if psi was the churn simons or something else that was good for giving you a topological invariant, then this operator constraint would be satisfied, would give you zero. So the, the differential operator applied to the wave function equals zero turned into topological invariance. And that's why this subject became called loop quantum gravity, because they figured that at least formally at this functional integral level, they could solve equations in loop quantum gravity about these quantum wave functions by understanding the topology of the loops in the three space on which things were happening. So that's it, quite intriguing. Is uh, it supposed to be a minus somewhere in that? Um, uh, uh, undoubtedly, uh, uh, there is. And let me see. The G was defined with a minus. And therefore, yes. when I integrated, I got another minus and was able to forget about the minus. Oh, okay. Here. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Some. More that that's a case where it actually worked. Usually the signs go wrong on me. Thank you. Um, okay, so that's a really nice idea. And they carried this as far as they could in the early literature. You'll see a book by Poulin and other people. Um, they carried it at the functional integral level as far as they could, but eventually, because the functional integrals are hard to deal with, uh, they shifted to working with other ways of evaluating that are morally similar using spin networks and things like that. But these notes, these notes contain, and this is the other one, the Hamiltonian constraint and how it behaves, but you don't want to see it. Uh, and uh, I've described this a bit. And then in these notes, I, I decided uh, well, never mind. There's a, a various summaries of some things here. I'm just showing you what's in the notes in case you wanted to look at them. And then there is a paper uh, that I happened to like by Poulin from long ago, which was an introduction, introduction to the loop quantum gravity at this level. Um, it's called a primer. And um, it could be regarded as a short form of the longer book that he wrote. Um, in any case, the, the paper is back there on the archive in case you want to see the whole paper. But I thought that at some point I would try to talk about this. And so I, I took clips, enough clips of the paper so that one could look at it in a slideshow. And again, uh, this is, this is a, a complexity that we're not going to go into, but the method that they use re involves using Einstein's theory and restricting it to a three space that's evolving and then using gauge theoretic variable transformation due to Ashtakar. And uh, this is summarized here. So this is a way of looking at Poulin's paper. But if you do, I suggest you pull up Poulin's paper because all I've done is taken what I felt were appropriate clips for uh, talking points. And 
this goes on for a while and we'll skip through it. But I just wanted to tell you what was in the slides that you will get eventually. Off this goes. And then remember what we talked about in the previous talk. We talked about the silly of invariance in the abstract and how if you just did it by ordinary knot theory using the formula and rigid vertex graphs, then you would get the four term relation from the topology. And then you would find that the four term relation is formally related to the commutation relation in the Lie algebra. And so is implied by it if you use Lie algebra um, insertion uh, and you can get the Lie algebra weights. And that formally also the four term relation is related to the Jacobi identity in the abstract. And we talked about all of that. And there's more to say. And then this is what we're after today is to think about the Kinsevich integral, which looks like this. So in order to talk about that, uh, I'm using um, a paper of mine from a while back uh, where I did that. Um, that is, I looked at how the Kinsevich integral arises from Witten's integral. But let's slow down now. And remember what the gauge field looks like. Looks like this. These are smooth functions, A upper A sub K of X, smooth function. TA is a Lie algebra basis. And you're given some matrices for that usually. And I don't know that I need to uh, worry about the details of traces of these products or anything for the rest of these notes. but. That's a quick summary of that. And it's useful to have the epsilon identity, but I don't know that I really use it either, but I like the epsilon identity. The epsilon identity is three index epsilon, one, two, three in some order is equal to either plus or minus one. One, two, three will be plus, one, three, two will be minus. Um, and zero if there's any repetition that's a sign of the permutation and it satisfies this nice identity that if you tie an epsilon to itself along one line then it decomposes into a sum of two chronic or delta crossed or not crossed as the case may be um i don't know that i need to use that but now we get the things that we do need um this is a famous integral and we have to evaluate it. So this is a Gaussian integral, integral of e to the minus lambda x squared over two dx. Uh, and the well-known solution to evaluating this integral is to square it, see that you integrate over the plane, uh, change variables to polars, and resolve what you have and find that, of course, since in polars, you're going to be integrating around a circle, uh, and the other part of the integral is an ordinary one variable integral, you get a two pi in there, and the value of the integral itself turns out to be the square root of two pi over lambda, or lambda is now replaced by lambda inverse in the evaluation. The next level of this integration we're going to need to do these kind of integrals in a generalized form in order to look at the expansion of Witten's integral. So that's why I'm doing this calculus. Here's another one where I have e to the minus lambda x squared over two plus j times x, okay? Um, and notice that if you were to differentiate the left-hand side with respect to j, then you would, bring an x down into the integration. If you're differentiated with respect to j three times, 
you would have an X cubed in the integration. And if you differentiated with respect to J three times and evaluated that J equal to zero, you would be looking at a moment integral. You'd be looking at the integral of dx e to the minus lambda x squared over two multiplied by x cubed. Those moment integrals are needed. So to evaluate this integral, you complete the square in the x squared part and add on the remaining term that you need to compensate. And uh, that, as you see, results in a factor of e to the j squared over 2 lambda, and then of the integration of e to the minus lambda over 2 x minus j over lambda squared. This is an integral from minus infinity to infinity, and so it's invariant under translation. And so that means that this integral with the j is the square root of 2 pi over lambda multiplied by e to the j squared over 2 lambda. And this then tells you how to evaluate all those moment integrals if you wanted to evaluate them. Because as we said, if you differentiate the left-hand side with respect to j, you pick up the moment integrals. And if you differentiate the right-hand side with respect to j, you can do this using elementary calculus. So if you want the moment integral for x to the 300, you just differentiate e to the j squared over 2 lambda 300 times, collect the terms, evaluate at 0, and multiply by square root of 2 pi over lambda, and you have the answer of the, for the moment integral. So these are good exercises for second term calculus, I guess. Um, what have I done? I actually wrote it out. Well, I only began to write it out. You can have some fun seeing what the, this kind of a binomial theorem involved here in differentiating that. And, um, and you can track it using graphs and so on. It's a small example of Feynman graphs and things like that. Um, what else do I want to say about this? Um, yeah, it foreshadows what we're about to see. Here you have the inverse of lambda. This is a little quadratic form. Lambda is the um, matrix for the quadratic form one by one. And here is the inverse of the matrix for the quadratic form. This is the operator. And here's the inverse of the operator. And as we generalize this to many variables, that's how it's going to look, as you'll see in a moment, that we'll have an operator for the quadratic form linear operator, and we're going to have the inverse of that linear operator invoked in these evaluations. Yeah. So for example, suppose that I have a quadratic form, x a x transpose up there in the integral, and I'm integrating over Rn. Um, well, uh, let's suppose that A is symmetric and that I tra and that in fact I diagonalized it. And then you see it breaks up into a bunch of things uh, exactly like what we just worked out. And so we will be looking at this, where we have the sum of lambda i xi squared and the lambda i's are the diagonal elements in that matrix. And so um, when I evaluate this integral, I get a product uh, over the square roots of 2 pi over lambda i. And the product of the lambda i's is the determinant of a. And so you see I'm getting 2 pi to the n over 2 times the square root of the determinant of the inverse. And we want the moment integrals. So if we do the moment integrals, we complete the square, but we do it at the level of, of the quadratic form. So we have inner product of x and y is x transpose a y. Um, and then I'm looking at x plus a inverse j, inner product x plus a inverse j. And I work out the linear algebra and I get uh, this extra term, j transpose a inverse j. And so the result of that is that when you complete the square, in the general form of things, you end up with an exponentiated J transpose A inverse J, where, um, where J, uh, where A is the inverse of the operator. And as I said, it's the inverse of the operator that has, that has to come in here. 
and then there's evaluating at zero. So you can evaluate z of j by taking it at zero where there isn't anybody here and it's the usual integral and then this. I'm really just repeating myself, except there is the matter of finding the moments and I might write it out here. Here's the moments for this integral. Uh, and then I need to differentiate with respect to um, the different variables for the J's. So I have this J transpose A inverse J and I have a multiple differential der derivative with respect to um, the different powers of j for the different powers of x and that that's the uh form of getting the moment integrals which are the correlations and then it's possible to do some rewriting so you only have to do it in pairs and i won't bother you with that so now what will happen if we're going to do this in for the churn simons form and the Wilson loop and Witten's integral. Now we're uh, we're looking at a quadratic form, but it's no longer finite dimensional. But we will play the same game with this infinite dimensional quadratic form as we did for the finite dimensional ones. So let's consider the abelian case and see how linking numbers come out. So now Witten's integral in this case is no Lie algebra, you just have AI of X DXI, okay? Um, and we have the integral of A DA. So there's no, no, there's no, nothing else going on there. Um, and so we need to understand the integral over R3 of the trace of A wedge DA. And you write that out. You got AI DXI plus a wedge with D, J, A, K, X, J, X, K, right? Uh, and that gives you A, I, D, J, X, A, K and, and uh, volume form. Uh, and then putting it in order, D, X, 1, D, X, 2, D, X, 3, gives you the epsilon. So there the epsilon came in. Um, you're summing over the different uh, permutations with their signs. And... And then you recognize that that is A dotted with the curl of A. Good. So we're getting some recognizable advanced calculus here. A dotted with the curl of A. Um, and then you can um, play about with this. Uh, and I think I'd better skip the playing about using the epsilon and so on. And find that... Um, there is a natural, there are some natural properties of the, of the things that are involved here. You see curl of A dotted with the curl of A. So the curl uh, essentially is the quadratic, is the operator that you want to think about. And, and then I have done some fiddling with this, with a, a divergence and never you mind. The point is that when we define an operator related to the curl, that is the one we want, then we find that the square of that operator is giving us the Laplacian. And we're going to need to work with the inverse of operators, so it's good to get them associated with operators that we know a little bit about. So, so then, in the end, um, I, I didn't want to go into the details of this one, but you see, we do have we do have to integrate. Uh, we do have to look at a quadratic form with an L, and the, this L that I've written turns out to be the right a right L to work with. And then you can use some facts about the Laplacian. The Laplacian applied to one over R in three space gives you a three dimensional delta function. Um, which you can verify by using polar coordinates. And I shan't do that either. Um, um, so, that, um, so that if you take um, one over four pi times one over r distance between the points, that gives you the inverse of the Laplacian. And so we know about the inverse operator that way. So you see, you, you have to face this problem of finding the inverse operator. And 
then you can uh, rewrite the integral against this exponentiated quadratic form. Um, you can rewrite it in terms exactly like I showed you for the finite dimensional case. Now I'm going to skip this differential algebra a bit and tell you the end result, which is that the J L inverse J, which is the thing that we're going to want exponentiated, turns into this form, the integral over the product of the two components. We're looking at a linking number. We're, we're looking at K and K prime. Um, for the Wilson loop, j of x cross j of y dotted with x minus y divided by absolute value of x minus y cubed. And that guy is exactly the form that occurs in the Gauss linking number that Gauss defined way back in the 19th century. So the, the, the terms for the Gauss's linking number are coming out of this functional integral formalism by means of this analysis of the Gaussian and working with the inverse operator. It's a lot of analysis to get over to Gauss's form so that then what happens is that it looks like this, that the self-linking number or the linking number between two components um, is given by correlations, they're the moments of the a of x and the a of y on the two, the, the integral of the product or, or, or across them. So we have the integral over the product of the knot with, with the, uh, the two link components, integral over the gauge field, exponentiated a, l, a, um, a of x, a of y. That's the form. And then we can look at this correlation and rewrite the correlation as an iterated derivative on the exponentiated gadget with the inverse operator in it. And then you look at what that says and it says that you're looking at this derivative of this with the integral of, of the j dotted with the difference cross the j divided by x minus y cubed, the Gaussian, the Gauss linking number kind of gadget. And as a result, um, everything falls into place and you end up after doing that, integrating exactly according to Gauss's linking number formula. So Witten's integral implies Gauss's linking numbers in the case of the abelian theory. What's, and what's that? C. Some constant. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry to um, rush you through that, but but the point is that the the usual story about Gauss's linking number is more concrete and is explained carefully in many places. For example, in um, Rogers' book on geometric topology there's a very nice chapter on the gauss linking number uh, and you can find it in other places as well and and you can also understand how the gauss linking number behaves by thinking of a flat link diagram and looking at the way these cross products work because you're taking a tangent line to one curve and a tangent line to the other curve and certain dot products and cross products and you can see that it will only contribute in in a flat diagram where the two curves are going around one another a little bit out of the plane. If it's all in the plane, it vanishes. And so you can see that the linking number ends up being the same as the sum of contributions from crossings. But here, you see this coming in a different way from this integration and then working on the inverse of the operator for the quadratic form and finding the correlations and it comes out. Um, so that's quite remarkable, um, longer story about how to get to Gauss's linking number. And now we want to go farther. We want to talk about the non-abelian case. And in the non-abelian case, you have a wedge dA plus two thirds a cubed. You have this extra term in the chern simons form. And again, you can look at this as this is the quadratic form over here, the a wedge dA 
And then this is some further extra terms which have to be thought of as correlations against the Gaussian form. And, and then there is the Wilson loop. And the Wilson loop uh, can be uh, understood as another integral um, or sum of integrals. So let's slow down and look at that. The Wilson loop is the trace over the points on the knot of one plus a. Oh, and I made a coordinate transformation. I replaced, I'm sorry, I mean, I made a constant transformation. I replaced a by a over the square root of k. What that did was it took the Gaussian part and removed the, the coupling constant k from it completely, but it didn't remove it from the a cube term so that we end up with a one over square root here. You'll recall that that was i over four pi times k here, and we just got rid of it over here. Um, but it's everywhere else. And in particular, in the Wilson loop, which was one plus a product, right? Um, you have one plus a over the square root of k. And then you want to think about this product. If you, um, if you just think about it formally, then the product becomes a sum uh, where you choose or do not choose one term from each of these. So those sums become integrals over powers of a at different levels of, a, of n for each n and a one over the square root of k to the n. So you get the sum over n of iterated integrals um, over, over points on the knot, where uh, because here you're integrating in order, um, you, uh, you can put these integrals in the form of points less than next point, less than next point, and so on. So, you have the, so then the correlations become the integrals against powers of A, and then there are some other powers of A that are coming from the other part of the Chern-Simons form. So, so you can put all that together and you get quadratic form and then various terms that are essentially the correlations. And these are going to turn into the Feynman diagrams if you were to take the perturbative expansion of this integral. And when I say the perturbative expansion of the integral, I mean exactly that trick that I was showing you before of using the inverse of the operator. But that means you'll have to decide which way you're formulating this and then worry about how to take the inverse of the operator. And it can be done in full three space. Um, and then the things that you get, if you do it in full three space, uh, rather than making any special fixing of it, will look like this, where you have the knot in three-dimensional space and there are things that you have to evaluate. And uh, the, if uh, you will have point on the knot to point on the knot evaluations like this one, and they correspond to Gaussian kernels like the one we saw in the linking number case. And then there are some other terms that happen from the three-dimensional A cube part where that's integrating over all of space. So you get a sum over diagrams where the, you have to integrate these things over space in order to get the different terms. And then you take the terms that correspond to a given power of k, and you get formulas, differential geometric formulas for the Vassili of invariants. And um, this has at least been worked out formally in a lot of papers, but um, it's a complicated subject. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to fix the gauge in a certain way so that the so that the a cube term in the turn simons form goes away and that makes the expression in terms of these things simpler so let me stop speeding and talk about this a little bit i have a point in three space <coughs> excuse me I'm going to change to light cone coordinates in the sense that I will use x plus as x1 plus x2 
and x minus is x1 minus x2. Why that's called light concordance, I guess I better not try to explain to you, but um, but it has to do with the fact that in special relativity, you have things like x squared minus t squared, right? And x squared minus t squared is x plus t times x minus t. So if you broke something into a form of a coordinate of the form x plus t and another one x minus t, you sometimes call that a light cone coordinate, but we're not doing any special relativity here. Yeah, in fact, in this case, the t that I would like to think of as a, some kind of time variable or, or Morse function variable is the x naught. So I have three dimensions of space and I'm thinking of, I'm rewriting the coordinates in this way. And then you can rewrite the gauge connection in terms of a plus one, a minus one, and a not one. And we're dealing with this, the usual term Simon's form. And we want this to be the quadratic form. And we're going to assume that a, a minus is zero. And that makes this triple product zero. So we're fixing the gauge and restricting things in that way. And uh, then we only have to worry about the quadratic form. And if you work out what A wedge DA is, you find that you get a term like this. Remember we had plus, naught, and minus. Um, and, and then you can further play around with the integration by parts for that and see that the turn Simon's form, the quadratic form that we're after looks like this, a plus, a minus, and you're differentiating d minus on the a naught, where d minus corresponds to the coordinate x minus. Oh, by the way, if you're interested in looking at papers about this sort of thing, there's a paper by Froelich and King, which I was working with when I was trying to do this. And Froelich and King were working with the braiding case and the kinesnik zamolajnikov connection and doing the same thing. And my idea was that whatever they did, we could do for the Gonsevich integral. And you can, and you'll see how the formalism works. But on the other hand, uh, I realized maybe 20 years later that I don't understand certain aspects of this analysis. You'll see in a moment what I run into. But you see, uh, so far we're, we're okay, except for the fact that this isn't hard to follow. The D plus times the D minus, because those are sums and differences, is D1 squared minus D2 squared. So if you're, again, you're looking for Laplacians, but now in two variables, not three, um, you could put an I in there and you could think that what we really did instead of light cone coordinates is complex numbers, much better. So we'll look at X1 plus IX2, but we're thinking of it as related to X1 plus IX2 and X1 minus IX2. And then if you put that I in, then this, then the D plus D minus is going to be D1 squared plus D2 squared, the Laplacian. And the two-dimensional Laplacian of a, uh, defined on a complex number is of the, of the log of the complex number is equal to two pi times the delta function. Um, and so that says that the D plus D minus inverse operator is one over two pi times the log of Z. Now, again, you might be curious about how the heck are you supposed to get this delta function and so on. So this slide claims to do that by changing to polar coordinates and pointing out how things are simple away from zero and, and blow up at zero, which is what the delta function is telling you. Mm -hmm. So um, you can look at that. So, so then you see that I can figure out the d minus inverse by taking d plus times d plus d minus inverse and i can i get one over z so one over z is the inverse of the of the l that i need here 
And then we can go ahead and or put that into the functional integral and see what that says about the correlation functions. And we do need the correlation functions. You need to know what happens when you integrate against this product. What happens when you integrate against this product? What happens when you integrate against this product? And um, you can use the facts about the inverse operator and figure these things out, except for one point, which um, I realize I don't know how to justify, but it's plausible. And that is, you remember that what we did here I'm asking you to survey something you're not used to, which is annoying, I realize, but but otherwise um, the only way in would be <laughs> yeah, to go through these exercises over a period of a longer time, right? But we reformulated everything in terms of two variables out of the three. And the time variable, the the, the space variable going vertically, the X naught is left alone. So that this operator L really only depended on the Z. And so in a sense, these integrals and all the correlations are sliced up along different time levels. And, and looking closely at what Froelich and King did when they wrote down their correlation functions because I'm writing the same correlation functions they did. Looking at what they did, they put in a delta T for different times, for different values of X naught, for different vertical values of that Morse function variable that we'll see in a moment. It's plausible given that the operator here um, is not uh, uh, involved in varying T, but uh, it's not quite obvious, but that's what they did. So that the, you get a delta function on T minus S and it's very important. You're now beginning to see the form of the conservative integral beginning to appear, a one over Z minus W in this correlation function. And only at a given specific time, uh, if the times were different, there wouldn't be any. and as a result of that, uh, when you uh, go through the Gaussian integration and work out the correlations and put it into the not theoretic integral um, and look at the terms that you get, you, you can resolve it into term pair correlations. And then much of the pair correlations vanishes, except the case where you're looking at Z minus W and at a given specific time. And so the basic correlation is of the form DZ minus DZ prime over Z minus Z prime. And what, uh, and what that means is that using this method of writing out the perturbation series, you get, um, these integrals. Now, these are almost. This is almost the formalism of of the Kinsevich integral. Here, we're starting integration somewhere along the knot and going all the way around the knot and coming back. Um, and um, at every given level, though, um, the correlations are only from that level to that level. So those become the chord diagrams, and you have to evaluate the loops according to the Lie algebra insertions that happened there. And the rest is integration um, in complex variables like that. Uh, from, now it's beginning to look familiar to you if you're used to this uh, formulation for Vassiliev invariant. And the only change to get to the Kinsevich integrals is to put in a sign for and, and write these as, a, uh, as always going upward rather than going around the loop. And after you do that, you get a certain sign and you end up with the formalism that um, corresponds to the Kinsevich integral. And then of course you are dealing with this at a given uh, power of K. So that the Kinsevich integrals come out of the um, 
written integral via light cone gauge fixing. Um, and certainly that's interesting from the point of view of connecting various structures together. Um, from the point of view of making things rigorous, of course, this is an example um, with 2020 hindsight, where one could imagine taking the functional integral all the way over to this kind of formula and then saying, all right, but we want to, to make a rigorous story. So therefore we will just uh, work with these integrals and make sure that everything works right with them and that they satisfy all the relations needed to make an invariant. And that, of course, is the way you will see this often written up without the without any mention of uh, Witten's integral. You will see it written up in lots of places. Um, like there's a nice exposition of of, uh, of the Kinsevich integral in um, some books on a number of books on quantum groups, um, and there's a good exposition of it in a book by. Um, uh, a recent book on Vasily and Variants by um, Jackson, and I'm forgetting the other person's name. But there's lots and lots of good expositions of this, starting from here and doing it carefully and rigorously. Uh, I don't know how to do it carefully and rigorously, starting from Witten's definition, because Witten's definition doesn't have the measure theory. But what I had wanted was, uh, other than that, a careful, rigorous um, uh, line from there all the way over to here. Um, and the fact that it bumps into this um, heuristic about the correlation functions is, is still bothering me. It would be nice to understand the correlation functions better. I think you can see that this is a shaggy dog story and one doesn't get used to it except by going around on it in a lot of different uh, ways. But I hope you found the, the um, um, summary uh, that I've given you about it interesting. And maybe you'll enjoy taking a look at this sometime in more detail. Maybe you can solve my problem about the correlation functions if you think about it. And if you could figure out a correct measure theory for Witten's functional integral, that would be a good job. <laughs> well, has anybody got any answers to um, Lou's problems? To Lou's shaggy dog story? Has anybody got a shaggy dog story? Obviously not. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, well, thank you very much, Lou. I mean, there's a lot of a uh, lot of stuff to think about there. So, well done. Um, and so, what happens now? Um, I think uh, just. A few points other than to um, obviously to thank Lou for the talk. Um, we, we're hoping to have a talk next week and um, I will uh, send you around details. Then we're going to have a summer break and I can get down to writing my book um, and possibly lying on the beach somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um any any other comments from uh, what book is that roger well i'm i'm writing a book on uh, uh generalized knot theory and um so that um it's kind of like three quarters written um but, um let me finish it off and you only have to do it twice more yeah, probably. <laughs> send it off to the um, to the editors, and they'll send it back, no doubt. Um, 
anyway, uh, so I'm looking forward to maybe a talk from Sergey soon, and probably from Uwe. Maybe in autumn, sometime. In the autumn, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe Dale has a talk up his sleeve. Well. Um, for <laughs> sleeves. <laughs> There's nothing up my sleeve. <laughs> nothing. Just an and armpit. An armpit. And Scott, <clears throat> no doubt, give a talk. Uh, I don't have anything interesting to say right now. No, but you might do. Who knows what will happen over the summer. And, That's and right. Lou, Lou, I think perhaps we'll maybe continue this theme in the autumn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so if I don't see all you gentlemen next week, have a good break. But um, I think we're probably going to have a talk next week. So but I will send around details. So. Bye for now. Thank you, Roger. Thank you.